Hello everyone, this is uh, Shyam Vardarajulu from Orlando, Florida. On behalf of Robert Haas, the physicians of the Digestive Health Institute at Orlando Health, I would like to welcome you for this hot topic discussion in endoscopy. So this is a hybrid event. Uh, we have about 300 to 400 delegates from 56 countries who have joined us online. So we are in a restaurant in Orlando called Del Frisco's. It's an international drive. And we are here today uh, with some of our closest friends uh, in the audience, uh, for those of you who are joining us online, we have some gastroenterologists and surgeons. These are not only our professional friends, these are also our very close personal friends who have joined us on this occasion. So this uh, event, we are going to discuss about a couple of things in, in endoscopy uh, that is of increasing clinical relevance. And we have three uh, esteemed speakers. And these are uh, people who need very brief introduction. Uh, joining us uh, this evening is Professor Thomas Roche. Uh, he's a chief of endoscopy at University of Hamburg in Germany. So Dr. Roche is an expert in luminal endoscopy, pancreatic and biliary, and third space endoscopy. He's also the section editor for uh, in endoscopy for gut and former editor-in-chief uh, of uh, the journal Endoscopy. Uh, Dr. Peter Dragunov is a professor of uh, uh, medicine and gastroenterology and the chief of endoscopy at uh, uh, University of Florida in Gainesville. He is an interventional endoscopist with expertise in pancreatic and biliary endoscopy, particularly resections and third space endoscopy. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Vivek Kumbari. Uh, Vivek recently moved to Florida from Hopkins. Uh, he also has the distinction of being the youngest chief of medicine in gastroenterology of any major medical center in the world at age 39. Uh, he is a very accomplished endoscopist who, in addition to his expertise in all facets of endoscopy, uh, he is, uh, his additional interest is in bariatrics. So we will be uh, starting this discussion, but before we uh, get started, I want to thank uh, uh, Omega Imaging for supporting this event. Uh, they, uh, they are uh, the manufacturers of the only fluoroscopy unit that utilizes artificial intelligence to minimize radiation exposure to patients and providers. So thank you, Brian. And we're going to get started with this program uh, with Rob. OK, fantastic. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is um, really a special occasion uh, for us uh, and, and for me in particular. Uh, this is a gathering of uh, uh, our friends uh, and colleagues uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're very appreciative uh, for all of you being here. Uh, v introduced our, our speakers, uh, but I just want to take one minute uh, because uh, they all have a, a very close uh, relationship with me. Uh, I started doing endoscopic ultrasound in 1987. And at that time, you, as you can imagine, uh, it, was, uh, it was impossible. Uh, it was just impossible. I was sitting at Indiana uh, University at the time and there was this uh, young superstar from, uh, uh, from uh, Munich. Uh, and Europe was way ahead of us at that time in endoscopic ultrasound. And there was this young guy named Thomas Roche, who was kind enough to come over and, uh, and teach me endoscopic ultrasound uh, back in about 1988. And that was really one of the pivotal portions of my career. So I've known Thomas uh, since 1988. I hate that that gives away my age to a certain extent, but um, at any rate, uh, he's a, a really, really close personal friend. Peter Dragunov uh, was a fellow at MUSC uh, when I was uh, there, one of our early fellows when I first arrived. And uh, uh, he did some specialized uh, training in, in, in ERCP uh, and then went to the University of Florida. And uh, from my perspective, sort of, Looking back, um, I've been so pleased and, and uh, uh, really um, uh, ex exceptionally uh, uh, happy uh, at the way uh, Peter has uh, developed his career. I take no, no credit for it because everything that he's doing now, uh, he sort of developed on his own uh, through his career. But uh, Peter goes way, way back uh, to the early 1990s uh, when he was at MUSC. And Vivek, uh, although I didn't have a chance to, to train him, uh, he was a, a big mistake for us uh, because we, we uh, had a chance maybe uh, to get him to come to, uh, to MUSC to train, 
but he ended up at uh, Hopkins uh, with a really good friend, Tony Kalu. But uh, he's done a, a remarkable job um, at, at uh, Hopkins and now is at the Mayo Clinic. So these are really, really, really close uh, personal friends and I'm, I'm grateful for all of them to be here. So there's one, uh, what we're gonna do tonight is present uh, four brief videos. A and then uh, it is my job and, and V's job to sort of uh, tease out uh, issues from these videos that we hope will uh, educate you on the management of, of these particular cases. I'm just gonna let you guys silently, everybody silently look at it. Just decide what you think is going on. So that's not good on the right side, but on, okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna play this one more time and then I'm gonna ask my, uh, my faculty to resume their, their uh, uh, place at the front. So just to do some sort of, sort of editorial comments, uh, hopefully everybody can appreciate that this is a Barrett's esophagus. Um, I will put in a little bit of a personal plug uh, that you see that there is a clear cap on the end of this scope. Uh, this can be a point of discussion, but I, I feel fairly strongly uh, about uh, this cap in terms of uh, allowing um, uh, the best visualization uh, in this circumstance. And then finally, uh, uh, this happens to be an Olympus scope so that you can see that uh, we're doing NBI. Uh, and my other editorial comment uh, is that I think that uh, if you have an Olympus scope, uh, that you ought to be using NBI uh, always when you examine a patient with Barrett's esophagus. So I'm going to have the, 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 uh, the, uh, my faculty come back up now that you've seen this. So um, th this was referred uh, to us. Uh, and so just give me your preliminary thoughts about how you would manage this patient. And uh, Vivek, I'll start with you. What, what, what thoughts go through your mind? You're, you're being asked to manage this patient. Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I sort of try and split this up into, into different categories. So the first is the, the patient phenotype. You know, are they uh, an obese 60-year-old smoking uh, Caucasian male? And, and therefore, if you analyze that segment of Barrett's, the propensity towards cancer may be higher than a than an Asian female who, who's, who's 40, for example. So I think- Do you uh, rely on that more than the, the actual images that you saw? Uh, in terms of the immediate management, I'd, I'd sort of uh, rely you know, certainly mostly the on the images that I saw, but in terms of planning- 12 minutes uh, per case. Sort of therapy Keep me and ongoing surveillance, I would, uh, I'd, I'd be interested in considering uh, sort, of the, the, sort of the patient characteristics as well. Okay. Do you, do, you, do you think this patient, patient has non-dysplastic Barrett's just by looking at it? Um, I, I'd have to take a closer look, but, okay. uh, but no, I'd be concerned that there's dysplasia here. Okay. Thomas? I'm the bad guy here. Um, first Please. Of all, what's You're always the bad guy. <laughs> yeah. What's missing is probably acetic acid. That's what okay. I like to do. Okay. And there are a lot of inhomogeneous areas which could be uh, dysplasia. Okay. What we have seen in the last years is a Japanese brainwashing stating that we can see everything by endoscopy, which I distinctly do not believe. So I think what we have to do is staining, look at all areas and do a careful biopsy, because if there's dysplasia, you have to plan what you're going to resect and how much. Okay. Peter, does anybody do acetic acid in the United States? We do okay. in our institution selectively and just uh, to but elaborate. You're, you're you travel a lot and so forth. What right. is your take on acetic acid around the United States? Uh, very uncommon. Uh, and the reason is that it's not as obvious thing as when you do a Lugol's for squamous cell dysplasia, where the uh, lesions light up and uh, basically it's a bus driver type of uh, yeah. diagnosis. You can immediately see it. Acetic acid changes uh, are more subtle 
and the basic premise behind the stain is that uh, you get this white frosty appearance of the mucosa with acetic acid and the area that has dysplasia or cancer will become reddish faster than the rest of the frostiness because vasculature is more uh, pronounced in that uh, area. Uh, I find it to be difficult. Mucus clearly interferes with acetic acid stain, so you have to do a, some type of mu mucolytic uh, uh, therapy. Uh, so I use it selectively on a case-by-case -case basis. But back to your question. A, yeah, what's, a, what's your impression of this? Case? Right, a couple of things come to mind. That the area of uh, Barrett's, it's a long segment Barrett's, uh, yep. and uh, as Thomas correctly pointed out, it's not uh, uniform in appearance. Uh, there is some areas that clearly look different than the others. That's a red flag that dysplasia is uh, there. Secondly, I notice a few small erosions or ulcerations in the area of the G junction, mostly in the distal esophagus, uh, that were completely avascular. That usually a sign of an invasive lesion, except in Barrett's esophagus, because they may be related to reflux. So my question from clinical perspective is, has this patient already been treated with double dose PPI for a few months before this assessment uh, was made? Because then it becomes difficult to say what is reflux related um, uh, avascular area. Also, just to point out that you can be tricked by prior biopsies. The area of biopsy can look kind of like invasive lesion because it's completely avascular, it's basically healing scar. Uh, so those part of the history will be important for me. That said, MBI, the pattern is irregular, but you still have vascularity to it. So I will say that dysplasia is present, cancer most likely is not present. Okay, so just for the audience sake, uh, this is a, an area of a prior biopsy. This is squamous re-epithelialization within the Barrett's epithelium. So now I, I wanna move quickly. Uh, this patient has high-grade dysplasia. Okay, I'm just gonna well, tell you that there's quickly. One, there's one PPI warning. I've seen quite a few cases where somebody sent a, a biopsy-proven patient and it was almost completely healed when, when the patient arrived at us. So this advice to do PPIs and then two biopsies can be deceiving as well. So um, okay, I think you should take your so, biopsies right away. So this is high-grade dysplasia. This was referred to us, mm -hmm. to you, and this has high-grade dysplasia somewhere in it. So wh where are you going now? It's, it's in your endoscopy unit. You've been asked to, to treat this patient. What, what, what are your thoughts, uh, Vivek? Yeah, man, you, you'd go ahead and treat it. There didn't seem to be any sort of uh, contraindications to a definitive endoscopic therapy. Clearly, resection wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be easy to do. It'd be a, a massive uh, field resection. Uh, so I think an ablative approach would make sense. And you've got the combination of hybrid APC, radio frequency ablation uh, with the barrack system, and uh, you know, now the, the freezing therapies as well. Um, I think any of them would be reasonable. To, to me, I, you know, I would use a sort of radio frequency ablative sort of 360 strategy here. So from my perspective, this is the, the key issue when you're talking about therapy. Either this is nodular, which means you have to resect it, or it's what I tell my patients is smooth as a baby's butt, which means that you can apply either RFA or, or, um, or, or uh, cryotherapy. So it's either smooth as a baby's butt, or it's nodular. So you think it's, it's smooth as a baby's butt. You would apply, I, I appreciate that you're, you've not, you know, Thomas. I, maybe that's the difference between Europe and the States. I would go for resection, and that's why I need the mapping, so that I more or less uh, know how much I have to resect. And not too infrequently cancer comes out. Uh, a couple of uh, concerns. One, uh, I would uh, bring the issue of terminology nodular versus smooth. I like the smooth part. The nodular part, I would uh, say that lately we have transitioning to say visible abnormalities rather than nodularity because some of the visible nodularities may be depressed rather than a true nodules. And here we have plenty of visible abnormalities. Uh, and irregularities. 
the concern with RFA is that this esophagus seems to be quite tortuous, uh, a little bit dilated, uh, and you may not get a good uh, a position. Uh, I guess I have practiced in the US for more than 30 years, but I'm still from European background, and I will go with Thomas that uh, a resection of uh, targeted lesions, although this will be hard, uh, will be my primary consideration after, and after that follow with ablation. So if we decide that resection is uh, the appropriate way to approach this patient, um, how are you going to resect it? Um, and uh, I'll start with, I'll start, I'll give you a break, and I'll start with uh, Peter. Sure. Uh, are you gonna do a circumferential ESD? Are you going to do uh, a, a, just go to areas that are irregular or nodular and do p sort of EMRs all over the place? Uh, right. Are you going to do half the esophagus with uh, EMR and then come back? Right. What, what do you? What, how are you going to approach it? If I'm you're going, going to resect, you made the decision to resect. Absolutely, I'll come back to uh, Vivek's comment early in the uh, in uh, in our uh, discussion. Uh, it's important to know what the patient looks like. Do they have a quadruple bypass? Are, are they on two antiplatelet agents? Uh, do they have a family history of uh, esophageal cancer? And so forth and so on. Um, because... Uh, because you're going to do surgery if they have all those things? Well... Or you're not going to treat them if they have those things? Uh, no. Uh, I will be more likely to do resection over ablation. Uh, the We've already decided you're going to resect. Okay. So okay. Uh, are you going to do ESD or are you going to do EMR? You have two approaches. One is to do another careful endoscopy and hopefully define discrete areas of abnormalities, vi visible so, abnormalities. So you would biopsy these visual and then the bring the patient back after you've done the mapping? Correct. That is correct. And then okay. make my decision. I, I will try to do acetic acid. In this case, I think it will be helpful. Uh, try to see whether there is any discrete abnormality that you can target with resection, because if not, you're looking at 360 degree resection and I'll have a discussion with the patient that will be good buddies for about a year, not only to resect, but then to dilate the pretty much 100% risk so, of stricture. So why not resect the nodular areas and then come back and do RFA for the smoother areas? Too much of abnormality, Rob, at least to this look. I mean, it was not like one nodule, it was quite extensive. But you've got to resect the nodules. Yes. Maybe we can make a, a, a compromise. So when you do, when we do our mapping, because you do the same, then you define a stripe which will remain, which is hopefully at least a third. Yes. And the rest we will resect the entire barrel, right. because there's nothing worse than under resect, and then you are you end up with a mess of scar and residual right. barrel, and there's high grade in it, and then it's a lost battle. So, just out of, for theoretical purposes, let's say that you can actually map out an area and that there is a strip that you can leave behind. Are you gonna do it with piecemeal EMR or are you gonna do it with ESD? We will do, we are doing a comparative study on that's that right. at the moment. So it's a leading question. <laughs> it's a leading question. <laughs> it's undecided. It's basically Well, I know it's undecided. undecided. So, huh? so you're supposed to advertise your, your randomized trial. The study, right. Yes, please. Exactly, yeah. So, so Tom, Thomas is leading a, a randomized trial to answer that question because I don't think we know the answer. Um, it's obviously technically much easier to do EMR, uh, to map it out and do EMR, but it's unclear whether that is the right way to go. Um, and the, the better way to go may be to do on block resection with ESD. So Thomas is leading that and uh, Dr. Bang is um, getting that through the IRB now as, as we speak. So um, Vivek. You're la you have the last word on this case. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting case. I thought Peter published a paper on, uh, on EMR versus ESD uh, for, for, for Barrett. So I don't know if you want to share mm -hmm. a part of that over. Thank you for bringing that up, <laughs> except that it's not a randomized control study. No. So uh, uh, Thomas is to be congratulated for pushing this through. Uh, there is a lot of things that we don't know, and that's why we need the randomized control study, but we know something which is that EMR specimens are suboptimal compared to ESD specimens as far as evaluating the final histopathology. You frequently end up with inconclusive, uh, uh, not only lateral margin, which is obviously compromised, 
but deep margin because the specimens tend to occur, the uh, duplication of the muscularis mucosa frequently occurs in Barrett's esophagus, and sometimes you can overlook the presence of invasive cancer within the specimen, or you end up with some uh, inconclusive histopathology, and then you don't know what to do. We okay. have done a histopathology analysis of EMR and ESD from three expert centers, and in 30%, there is no subnicosa. 30% of the area, there is no uh, subnicosa as well. Uh, as with, a, with an EMR with specimen? Both. With both? Even ESD. I think ESD is often inhomogeneous, up and down, and EMR may not be in ideal form so deep. So um, that's also undecided. So I think the conclusions are that uh, this to me is a, is a, a nodular Barrett's. Uh, there are areas of, of irregularity. I think that, that the approach that you should take should begin with resection. Uh, I think mapping is, is difficult. And although there are published series, a number of published series about EMR versus ESD, uh, none have been uh, done in a, in a randomized control way. So I, I, we look forward to uh, the data that uh, will come out from uh, Thomas's study. Okay, so we got to keep. Let's ask if the audience has any questions. Okay. Does anyone have anything to add on this uh, particular topic? Hey, Thomas, uh, Mohs, uh, Mayo had a randomized uh, control trial comparing yes. uh, EMR right. ESD for early vascular neoplasia, and he showed that uh, there's no difference in uh, in terms of um, recurrence of patients. Yeah, but these were 40 patients. I mean, so it's, it's, not, it's not powered for outcome. Yeah, they looked at histopathology parameters. So yeah. we we are aiming at 400. Yeah, we have 120, but a long way to go. Right. And follow-up was only three months. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So EMR versus ESD, how much difference in terms of time consumption? If you were to do this one, what is the pros and cons of? Um, ESD takes a bit longer, but with the new techniques like doing a tunnel, it's not as painful as it used to, to be before. And the, uh, the painful meaning painful for the for the for the for endoscopist, the not patient. for the patient, right? <laughs> And the time-consuming thing with EMR is bleeding. So if it doesn't bleed, it's quick. If it bleeds, you have to do hemostasis after every piece. So that's it's kind of. So we do large areas, maybe EMR, 45 minutes, uh, ESD, 60, 90, depending. Huh? All right, Rob. Let's go to the next case. It's a very sophisticated case. <laughs> I want you to really study this. want us to guess the organ or? <laughs> <laughs> the species. Well, the species, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I'm going to play it one more time and then you guys uh, are going to get up and. Uh, okay. Okay, come on up, guys. So, uh, you know, there's not much excitement here, except that this is a removal of a diminutive polyp. Uh, so, should we have looked at this polyp uh, more carefully to determine if it's uh, hyperplastic or, or adenomatous? Uh, and if it's hyperplastic, we're going to leave it behind um, quickly. Yeah, no. I NBI didn't. or no NBI or just. Remove it. You, you can take it out and discard it. I mean, that was very nicely done. Okay. That, that'll probably okay. remind you later. Thomas? There's we no need? hyperplastic polyp above the rectum. They're all turned into ser uh, sessile serrated lesions by histopathologists. So they have to come out as well. So your practice is if you've got 20 5 millimeter polyps in the distal sigmoid colon, you remove all of those? Well, whether it's the rectum or the distal sigmoid, you can you can debate. But let's say above above the sigmoid, I think everything has to come out. Peter, uh, the MBI pattern for the brief shots that we saw looks like hyperplastic. The pits were exactly round and uh, very homogeneous pattern. If I'm to if I'm in Vegas and have to bet on this, I think this is a hyperplastic polyp. But in the U.S., at least at this uh, point of time 
probably outside of the rectal sigmoid, removing it, it's a great idea. Removing it was the proper technique or would you have done something differently? No, I think that looked good. Um, sort of clean margin, snare was placed nice and firm. Uh, used a bit of suction to, uh, to get as much tissue in the snare as, as one could. Thomas? That's the right way to go. Okay. Although we wouldn't have believed that cold is better than hot. Um, yeah, clearly. Uh, and actually, uh, our study, which is a randomized control study comparing jumbo forceps versus regular forceps, so we didn't have a snare arm, showed that we clearly leave behind stuff, even for some polyps like, uh, like this. So snare is the way to go. Uh, and cold snare, I would say, it's the way to go for this type of polyps because... Yeah. I think uh, you can do it with the forceps, but uh, it's very time consuming. You have to wash and look and it's, uh, you know, it takes three times as long. Agreed. If you want to do it properly. So in the, in the audience, I'm curious to know, uh, how many of you would have removed this polyp with a, a cold snare? And how many would have remo removed it with biopsy forceps? Okay, very good. How many of you uh, would have used a dedicated cold snare? So a thin wire mm -hmm. snare designed specifically for cold snaring versus just getting a small snare that, that you would use uh, for a hot snare. So how many would use a dedicated cold snare? And how many would just whatever is available, a hot snare or, or whatever? Okay. Okay. So, um, um, I think that, um, I mean, I want you guys to discuss this, but, but to me, uh, it's, it's now pretty well shown that at least in normal hands, the residual adenoma rate in these diminutive polyps, when you take them out with a, with a regular biopsy forceps, whether they're jumbo or regular or whatever, is high. And, and one of the current issues with colonoscopy is interval colon cancer and probably uh, insufficient uh, removal of uh, these polyps uh, is one of the causes of, uh, of interval cancers. So you mentioned it before, and, and maybe you can sort of reinforce it, because you mentioned there, there, there is a proper technique to this. Uh, and the, the goal is actually get um, uh, definite normal colon all around it, okay? so. Some people, you know, want to just get just the polyp, uh, but really the goal is to get a nice cuff of normal colon around it. And you mentioned the, the technique that uh, is applicable. A little bit of suction, don't make it uh, a really distended uh, colon. Put the, put the snare on so that the polyp is in the middle, so there's a cuff mm -hmm. of normal tissue suck a little bit to gather it in, close it slowly so that you can see that you're getting a, a cuff of normal tissue, uh, added things to the technique? No, uh, uh, I think what you described is perfect. Uh, uh, one recent addition has been the availability of small tin wire snares that can convert from hot to cold. And that is important probably not for this size poly, but if I can move to a size bigger, let's say five to 10 millimeters, then sometimes you may get stuck with the cold snare and it's good to have that option to convert to hot uh, uh, if you're inching your way towards the 10 millimeter. That doesn't sound good, inching your way towards <laughs> millimeters. <laughs> um, but uh, you, you, you get the point. Uh, so that, that may be a good compromise uh, for anybody in the audience to have one of those uh, double duty snares, they're small, Tin wire for cold, but they can convert to hot if need be. Can I ask you, do you ever get concerned if you're unable to close and cut that you've got muscle there? And, and in that case, would you be concerned about switching to, to current? Probably not with this size polyp. Anything below 10, it will be hard to grab muscle uh, for such a diminutive polyp. But Thomas, what's your take on this? Some, some snares don't do the job, even if, it, even if you don't have so much tissue. So the decision is to just pull it against the scope? Or, uh, so your, your colleague, uh, Mike Wallace, did, did uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you who do cold snare, uh, after you, if you grab a, a fair amount, and if you have to guillotine it, you know, you grab it and you just have to 
and pull it into the, to the body, you get this cuff of white tissue. And Mike Wallace showed that that is actually muscularis mucosa. Uh, and I, th I personally think that it is impossible to uh, grab muscularis propria and pull it into the biopsy channel and, and, and get a perforation. So I think that the safety of this procedure uh, is, is one of the major uh, issues. And I think something that, that, that wasn't appreciated, uh, certainly in, in my time, is, is that cautery, uh, rather than sealing potentially bleeding vessels, basically, I, I think, theoretically, just erodes into the wall of an, uh, of an artery. And instead of just slipping over that artery, which you do with a cold snare, you actually damage the wall of that artery in, in the process of applying heat, whether it's with a hot biopsy forceps or with a, a hot snare, and that's what leads uh, to delayed bleeding. So uh, I think the, the bleeding risk, there's zero perforation risk with a cold snare. The bleeding risk is, is, is almost nil and so I, I think the, the take home message from this is really diminutive polyps up to a centimeter uh, should be removed with, a, with a, a cold snare. And the data suggests that a dedicated cold snare with a thin wire uh, is the way to go, that they do a better job of complete resection than taking a, a hot snare off your shelf and, you, and using that for cold snaring. Rob, the, the interesting thing is, is the larger polyps, which is uh, <laughs> under investigation at the moment. It's certainly good for serrated lesions. Right. I can tell it, it doesn't bleed in the duodenum, surprisingly. So where you can have torrential bleeding, late bleeding. Uh, it could be that there's a higher recurrence rate, but uh, we don't know. I think there are a few randomized trials underway, right? And we need that uh, because I think the explanation that Rob gave earlier is the explanation why we have less bleeding. You leave uh, mucosa behind. That thing in the middle is muscularis mucosa, which means that basically you cut in a more superficial plane compared with the hot snare. And that's why uh, the bleeding is increased. And that has been repeatedly shown that you leave muscularis mucosa, which in this size polyp of no concern, but to Tom's point, if you're resecting a larger lesion called theoretically, uh, may leave some adenomatous tissue behind, but we need the data. There was a recent retrospective series with 40% recurrence rate after cold, but mm. that's a classic for a randomized trial. Of course, yeah. of course. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay. So I'll just give you a brief introduction to this patient. Uh, this is a patient with primary sclerosing conjunctus uh, who came with a stent. And the patient was admitted in the emergency room with sepsis. The stent was removed. And this was an ERCP that Dr. Bank performed. And then she sees pus coming out of the bile duct. So I don't think we need to play this video. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. This is all you get. Yeah, that's all you get. We'll just tell you, the pus, there's pus coming out of the bile duct. So, so Thomas would argue that this is an American problem, uh, but this can happen to anyone. So we are going to clean this bile duct, obviously, and uh, we will re-stent because the stitcher is very long, and the patient is seriously jaundiced. I mean, the blue ribbon was about 18.7. The cultures were positive for E. coli. So now, Vivek, you're, you're having this patient. You have, you have cleaned up. You are now putting in another stent. Uh, it could be a fully covered stent. It doesn't matter. How will you... What will you do to this patient in this uh, current atmosphere in 2021 about infection and ERCP? Can you prevent this from happening again? And what would you do to, to prevent that? Yeah, I think we'd give some intraprocedural antibiotics, certainly for a, a dominant high-grade stricture like this. Then the question is, is there any uh, sort of scope-induced uh, transmission of, uh, of, of bugs you know, with the sort of insertion of that stent? Um, and then one could argue with future endoscopy, you know, would you use a, uh, a mechanism to decrease the rate of that infection, such as a single use? With the I'm going to would, ask, you? would you? Yeah, would you? Would the you? Next time the patient comes back in three months for a stent change. If, uh, if Mayo allowed me to, uh, to bring in a single use steroid <laughs> endoscopes, uh, yes, I would. Peter, how would you? Uh, I, I, I would. This would be a good case because you knew ahead of time that this patient is cholangitic. 
so you can make a good case uh, uh, knowing ahead of time that uh, it, this is a risk for contamination of the endoscope. Uh, not that much. Well, yeah. that, that would help the next patient. Correct. But it won't help this patient. That is correct. That is correct. Uh, so you would use a, a, a disposable duodenoscope to prevent the scope that you're using from being contaminated and infecting the next patient? That is one reason. The second reason is specifically in PSC, you can try your best, but you are never able to drain everything. <laughs> you always have some bioducts that are left undrained. They may be high up, but uh, some contrast hangs around. So I would say that even for the uh, that purpose of this patient, it's uh, probably a good idea to use a single-use uh, duodenoscope. But should but all but PSC patients then ha have a? Yeah, uh, in my opinion, that will be a very reasonable approach. Uh, in our institution, we have a protocol because cost, of course, will come into consideration. And as uh, Dr. Kumbari pointed out, uh, some institutions uh, w either don't allow it or they allow it under restricted uh, situations. So you have to come with a game plan of which situations you're going to use a disposable duodenoscope. And to me, PSC is one of those situations. So the question here is, was the procedure um, that was done uh, yielded inadequate drainage, or is it all scope related that that, that led to the infection? I mean, nobody knows, but mm. uh, we know that in PSC, uh, that prior instrumentation, no matter what scope you use, it's a risk factor for cholangitis, particularly if you have undrained system. And in PSC, that's the perfect setup. Should, should the scope that was used be sequestered and cultured? If you have a patient coming in, they've got cholangitis X days after an ERCP, would you make every effort to <coughs> find that soap, sequester it, and culture it before you put it back into the... We don't have use? such policy in our institution, but it seems like a reasonable approach. So Vivek, what is the policy at the mayor? Do you ha are you obliged that someone comes post ERCP with cholangitis, that the scope is sequestered, you report to the FDA, you do a pan culture of the scope? No, we don't. No, I mean, we, we ETO all our scopes, but uh, all our duodenoscopes, but no, there's no such policy. I mean, at, uh, for all uh, transparency, at least, that's what we do. Uh, if you have a patient with PSE and uh, they come back to us with cholangitis or any reason, and if, it is, if the blood culture is positive, automatically we tell our, uh, our nurse managers to culture the scope, the scope is sequestered, and we go through the process. Thomas, any words of wisdom on this? Uh, <laughs> uh, I was wondering wh why you didn't ask the European opinion up to now. <laughs> so I, I think th that the patient was treated with a, w not treated with a single-use duodenal scope is the least of his problems. I think if you have a PC patient and pass, then you are in serious trouble. Um, and every bile in, in, or every patient's bile is infected once once you you do something in the bile. So I think the the most likely reason was insufficient drainage. So I'm going to just uh, so sorry. Uh, so before you do a PSC patient, you should have an MRCP okay. and avoid over injection of segments mm. you are not draining, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's why where his problem is coming from, with 99% likelihood. The remaining 1% might be the scope, but uh, I think we are on, on the wrong track, arguing for single-use endoscopes for, uh, for, yeah, uh, on, on the occasion of this case. So I'm, you can't answer this question, and Rob definitely can answer this question. Uh, this goes to only Peter and Vivek. 2025, move fast forward four years. <laughs> what percentage of ERCPs do you think will be performed with a single use scope, and don't look at both of them. So basically, V's telling me that I'm not going to be practicing in 2025, which really pisses me off. But I don't know. <laughs> Getting social security check is not bad. I mean, <laughs> uh, but joke aside, uh, uh, I will uh, quote Niels Borg, the nuclear physicist. He says predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. Um, uh, so uh, there will be two reasons for us to convert to disposable duodenoscope. Uh, 
Uh, one is that we accumulate evidence slowly over time that it's a good idea because a lot of endoscopes are uh, contaminated and that will take time. The other thing is it could be just a consumer driven thing. Uh, it may become inacceptable, uh, like zero tolerance, a patient to come to the hospital and we as doctors giving them an infection. Uh, and if you look at where we stand right now and you backtrack 20 years, everything at one, at one point was reusable and now pretty much everything except duodenoscopy so, is a single use. So Peter, I just wanted a number, your percentage. Uh, well, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, finances are very important, but I can tell you that. So is it low? Is low. It I'll go Five percent, ten percent, or is it ninety percent? Five. <laughs> so Peter, I um, mean, Vivek. We have another outbreak like UCLA. It, it could be as high as, as fifty percent. You know, I know in UNG and, and the rest of your group, you know, published some work on sort of optics and, and maneuvering of the single-use scopes. And I think if that continues to progress, as it seems to be. Sure, 50%. So, so I'm going to hang my career. I will say 33% in five years is going to be a single use school. So is that 33.333? <laughs> that is. So I think, uh, um, uh, Rob, do you want to have, proceed to the next topic or should we engage the audience on some uh, questions? Think about, the, to close this up, think about the single use endoscopist. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, 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 a general question for the audience. I think we, uh, we will present this last case and, and we'll sort of do it briefly, but um, uh, are, are any of you using uh, single-use duodenoscopes in, in your hospital? Okay. I can tell you that those using a lot of single-use bronchoscopes in our hospital. Yes. Yeah, 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 it's like very common in ICU. Right. Yeah. So hopefully it will come to yeah, but I think that's a that's a different issue in yeah. hospitals because these are the problem is not the the um, pulmonology department, the problem is that hundreds not hundreds but many dozens of uh, uh, ICU doctors use these scopes. They throw them away. They yeah, you have very high re repair costs. So that that's a very different market from dedicated scopes with dedicated um, um, endoscopists. That's why. You know, they, uh, all these companies were so uh, successful with bronchoscopy because it's on ICU all over the uh, Yeah, there, there's also a distinct advantage when you have to go to the unit. Yeah. Uh, you can just do the bronchoscopy and throw it away. Uh, mm -hmm. I think probably a, a, a lot of the infection problems, I, this total speculation, but uh, probably if you track it, uh, uh, the infection problems may in part be due to a duodenoscope used in the middle of the night for a cholangitis patient or an upper endoscope used for a bleeder in the middle of the night and those scopes maybe are, are left around longer, not cleaned properly, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes a lot of sense for the ICU um, uh, in, in that context. Like they get bronchoscopes every other day. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. ultimate cost is going to be higher. Yeah. 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 So, Rajiv. A little off the topic, but uh, COVID-19, any issue of transmission of COVID-19 with endoscopy? You mean to say you have to use uh, single-use endoscopes because of COVID-19? <laughs> no, 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 that's, no, no. You know, with the world, you know, the way it's shut down and, you know, uh, CNN and all those uh, TV channels feeding the frenzy, using that and the public's perception of infection transmission, would that play into pushing towards single-use endoscopy per se, not just donoscope, everything single-use? Maybe, because in the area of hygiene, uh, it, you don't usually work with evidence, you're working with threats. Mm. And saying, who are I could be. So that works the best.
Okay, so come on up. Uh, I remain silent because this is really an extraordinary thing for me. Uh, it's something that I've been able to see in my career, uh, and I had some interactions at the early point uh, working with Jay Pashricha and, and Chris Gostout at the early stages of development of, of this, this third space endoscopy, so it's, it's, um, it's really a fascinating thing. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this a lot because uh, I assume that probably not many people in the audience uh, actually do it. But um, first of all, Thomas, uh, tell us about um, endoscopy poem versus surgery. Yeah, we did a, yeah. we did a uh, That's randomized. That's another lead-in. We, <laughs> we did a uh, randomized trial showing that uh, surgery and endoscopy, which do the same thing, have the same effectiveness at two years of uh, 82, 83 percent. There is more reflux initially after endoscopy. The difference gets smaller at two years, but we will see. So if you do POEM and um, if you have a lot of achalasia patients and only do POEM, there's something wrong with you, I think, because you should give patients the choice of surgery, balloons, or the, I think the other techniques haven't vanished yet. So you have a more individual individually adapted selection now. Peter, what's your take on where we stand with POEM and, and so forth? Uh, I basically agree with Thomas. Uh, at this point, uh, pneumatic dilation, surgery, and POEM are considered first-line therapy for achalasia. Uh, and you consider some patient specifics uh, as far as uh, the type of achalasia and uh, mm -hmm. narcotic use, presence of gastroparesis, because those are uh, predisposing factors towards acid reflux if uh, present, uh, and also patient preference. I mean, a poem uh, by large extent has been driven, among other things, by patient demand. There is a tremendous attraction of doing the procedure through the mouth and no external cut. Although, as correctly Thomas pointed out, the end result is about the same. Uh, so I do talk with the patient, all three on the table. I do uh, close to 100 poems a year. Uh, at the same time, I probably do uh, around 15 pneumatic dilations per year for various reasons. And we do refer some patients uh, to our surgeons. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the space, I know, I know G's done somewhere between 150 and 200 uh, poem procedures. And, and uh, so I think the space is very interesting, particularly for people of... Uh, of our generation, um, the, uh, and, and as you know, you can do this in the esophagus, uh, the, uh, the the zenkas, um, stomach as, as well for gastroparesis, and also the, the rectum. You know, uh, I'm Albert Pai is published Hirschbrunk. nicely there. Yeah, for Hirschsprung. So only the anal sphincter is safe. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> very very important. So I think it's a very exciting space. You know, um, uh, a relatively safe procedure. You know, thanks to the likes of you know the gentleman on my. To gentlemen on my left, you know, we, we, we have learned how to do this well uh, and efficiently uh, with good clinical outcomes. So I, I don't do POEM, uh, so I'm going to be very naive with my question. Um, where is this going to lead to? I know that uh, Rob invested a lot of his early stages of his ASG presidency in hmm. driving a concept that went nowhere. It's called notes. <laughs> uh, will, this, um, the, will, will this third space endoscopy probably lead to greater advances in endoscopy, more invasive, maybe like esophageal cancer staging, which we don't do a very good job with the notes and so forth. Are we going somewhere more? Or are we just going to stay within the third space? Yeah, I, I think we'll do a lot more. You know, I think we, we will end up exiting the, uh, the GI tract. We now have uh, uh, techniques where we can apply traction, have multiple arms. I, I think the door is open now uh, for, for a multitude of, of tech. You know, when you think about uh, implanting things in the submucosal space, to treat certain conditions, uh, stimulate certain organs. Mm. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, it, I think we'll, we'll see a new uh, reignition of, uh, of therapy outside the luminal, uh, luminal space. I agree with Vivek. I mean, it's, uh, uh, the NOTS concept is still very much viable, but it will be an evolution rather than the revolution that uh, we thought we will have in the mid-2000s. Uh, and Probably lap cholecystectomy was not the best target for us to tackle initially. Uh, and, but in a way, uh, POEM is an offshoot of knots. We would have not had POEM if it was not the uh, knots uh, concept. So I think the future is bright, but we will slowly move our way into various procedures. So 
One last question, just really quickly. So, of the of the categories of a Calasia, which ones rank them in terms of their uh, appropriateness for for poem? Right. So, type three achalasia is a primary target for poem, which is favored over heller or pneumatic dilation. And the main reason is that uh, you can extend the myotomy as long as needed based on the manometry findings of the... So, so type 3 is number 1? Correct. Type 2 is... Uh, either. either. Uh, I mean, type 2 is the one that responds best to any type of therapy. And type 1? Mm -hmm. uh, either. And, and what about just uh, isolated uh, lower esophageal sphincter hypertension? That is a tough one, and I'll tell you why. Because in the last few years, we have learned that uh, narcotic medications can mimic on manometry uh, spastic esophageal disorders, if I can lump all those into one group. And then it becomes a tough dilemma when somebody has a back pain and for the last 15 years have been on whatever dose equivalents of morphine, and now they have esophagogastric junction outlet obstruction or jackhammer esophagus or whatever. What do you do with them? Because, yeah, you do the poem, but then you're really setting them up for bad reflux because emptying is slow from the stomach. And I have had a couple of patients uh, that uh, we have had a tough uh, time. In addition, now selectively I check CYP2C19 status, which is the enzyme uh, that processes, uh, Plavix is the main drug that uh, that enzyme came to be famous with, but also PPI. Some people do not respond to PPI the way uh, a normal CI CYP status is. But I would love to hear what uh, uh, Thomas and Vivek has to say about the poem superiority in specific patients. Do you, do you have any disagreements? No. Okay. And, and then my last question is gastroparesis. Uh, do I send all of my patients, irrespective of the cause for gastroparesis, to you guys for for G-POEM, or uh, again, can you rank the, the patients that will, are lo most likely to benefit? Well, the enthusiasm uh, has been waned a little bit with more recent results of 56% uh, efficacy. Subgrouping is not yet possible. My feeling is- It's not is, yet possible? No. Okay, we I don't have the data. So. No. I, I, my feeling is that post-operative gastric emptying uh, disorder is a, is a good indication, but uh, there are not enough data. Agree. Uh, our data, unpublished yet, uh, support exactly that. Lung transplant, heart transplant, uh, gastric pull-ups for uh, esophageal mm -hmm. cancer, those tend to respond very well as opposed to idiopathic or diabetic uh, gastroparesis. Uh, I've been very slow moving in my area my, myself, uh, probably because I'm scarred for life from the sphincter of audio dysfunction uh, <laughs> uh, experience. Uh, and I'm cautious just because we can do it. <laughs> you guys are crucifying me tonight. Uh, yeah, just, uh, no, I mean. No it, respect for the elderly. <laughs> Uh, 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 but admittedly, uh, there is a big difference. Uh, G-POEM, I think it's far safer than ERCP in somebody with normal ducts and normal LFTs. So uh, uh, some people in Europe uh, advocate G-POEM for everybody and whoever responds, responds, who doesn't, doesn't. Uh, we don't have any good therapies anyway, so might as well give this a shot. But I think this team has come a few times. We need more data. We have about three or four minutes, so we can take a couple of questions from the audience on anything you want to know about endoscopy. Yeah, it's an excellent platform. I mean, we appreciate for organizing this. So, uh, going back to the infection risk, uh, I know um, the climate change is real. It depends on who you talk to. Uh, about the infection risk and uh, the plastic, you know, that we kind of generate as the healthcare system itself. I mean. We generate around like uh, you know two to three pounds for each case. So, and you know we talked about the disposable scopes, <laughs> but in that same realm, how is that uh, the disposable tip compared to the disposable scopes by itself in the duodenoscopes? Well, I, I think I can answer that. Um, the biofilm formation and maximum pathogenic organisms are found mm -hmm. in the tip of the duodenoscope by the elevator. So the detachable cap does help with cleaning that area. 
But if you do a pan culture, you culture all the way from the buttons all the way down to the channel, then 60% of the organisms are not resolved by the detachable tip. The second question is, those organisms that are in the channel and the suction button, how serious are they? Not really. Most of them happen to be some common cells, just natural things you will find in the human body. Uh, it does not resolve everything. There was one abstracted DDW that showed us that you can decrease the infection risk by between 30 to 50 percent with a detachable cap. 50 percent not resolved. Of that 50 percent, 5 percent continues to be serious infection. So you're literally looking at 2.5 percent. Is that all? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's it's an evolving uh, yeah. area. Certainly, the 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 ultimate end game is is a disposable scope uh, that will will be sterile. It will be completely clean. Uh, I think the what's what's not yet determined is whether there is is something that's going to be effective that's short of that. Either with uh, these removable tips, whether it's uh, Cleaning, whether it's uh, you know J pass reaches sleeve, uh, um, we, uh, I don't I don't think we know. I'm just receiving some. Yeah. yeah. Go on, uh, Basco. Uh, regarding the poem, do you still do a poem for the patient who already failed on pneumatic dilatation? Can, can you do a poem if somebody's had a pneumatic? Absolutely. Uh, so for any type of failed therapy, a poem is a good option, uh, including uh, pneumatic dilation and including heller myotomy. Uh, and what about Botox? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you do see some increased submucosal scarring, but of those three uh, categories, uh, to me, the heller, prior heller myotomy are the technically most challenging ones, but I would love to hear what my colleagues have to say. Well, apart from hellers, if I had to, to guess whether the patient had Botox or pneumatic dilatation, I would probably be wrong in 50%. Of the instances, yeah. so. But you you can see a difference. There there is no. some fibrosis there. No. For, no. So you can't tell a virgin patient from somebody who's had Botox or. If I did didn't have any knowledge, which if you didn't which have I it, shouldn't, but uh, which, yeah. which you should. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, Basha. In your choice of the treatment, can we repeat the question, Rob? Uh, but the audience. Yeah, so, so the question is: In long segment Barrett's esophagus, does the size extent of the uh, of a hiatal hernia have any effect on how you approach uh, treatment of that patient? I can I can tell you that um, at least the Northwestern group feels very very strongly that uh, if there is significant reflux, that that should be that should be taken care of. Uh, and I think for me personally, uh, the, the failures for RFA uh, are almost exclusively in those who have a, a lot of reflux. So I think it's a, it's a um, I personally think it's a, it's a little bit neglected uh, that we, we, we see these patients with large hiatal hernias, uh, we treat them, you know, they don't have too much effect from RFA. We do it again, we do it again, we do it again. And I, I think the key there is controlling the reflux. I will take Agreed. a little bit different angle, Rob. Uh, clearly, you should address the reflux one way or another, either by repairing the hiatal hernia or PPI or whatever. But the, re yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, PPIs are a given. Yeah, uh, yeah. but the recurrence uh, in many cases is uncontrolled reflux, but I believe in many cases is inadequate RFA or simply missing nodular lesions that were RFA uh, on top of that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you have to select the right patient. The baby butt is a great analogy. That is the right patient for RFA. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think and the, that we simply RFA patients that are not best treated with RFA only. They will need resection plus RFA. So I'm just looking at my phone and getting text messages from India and Europe that uh, they have to go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the day is dawning back in Asia. So I want to thank uh, all of our guests for, uh, for this fantastic evening to come join us. And Thomas, uh, Peter, and Vivek, uh, thanks for giving this evening to us and, uh, and being here. And on behalf of the, the Orlando Health Digestive Health Institute, 
Thanks, Brian, for supporting this event, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you, and good night.